morning, everyone. We're so glad that you joined us on this morning for another discussion of our Sunday school lesson. And we, as always, give thanks to God for just allowing us the opportunity to be here. And so let's, let's give thanks to God, first of all. God, our Father, we come now in your holy name. God, we come thanking you for all your many blessings. Thank you, God, for this opportunity to delve into your word. And God, we hope that, that something that we say on this morning that will help someone on their spiritual journey. Now let the words of my mouth and the dedication of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Okay, the day is April 20th, 2020. And we remind you once again that our theme for the year is The Time Is Now. Our unit theme for this month, these three months, is God is providing for us now. The lesson topic for today, trusting in God for our needs. And our background scripture comes from 2 Kings 5, 1, and 14. The essential question, who do you trust? Think about it. Who do you trust? Is it your family? Could be your spouse, your parents, or some other family member? Is it someone at your church, your pastor, your deacon, or other church members? Now, one thing I, I, I want to point out is that sometimes when we put our trust in people, people will sometimes let us down. And whether it's intentional or unintentional. Sometimes it's unintentional because it's because of the circumstances in our life. You know, life happens. People may promise that they're going to do something for you or they're going to supply a need. And something comes up and they just can't do it. That happens. But when that happens, it is the responsibility of that person to call the other person involved and let them know that they won't be able to do it. That's a part of trust, being trustworthy. And you don't have to explain the circumstances, but it would be good if you do. But let them know why it is that you didn't do whatever it was that you promised them that you would do. The other thing is that sometimes it is sad to say it is intentional because people will make you promises that they don't have any intention to keep. And, and those kind of people are people who we call that are untrustworthy. And you don't want to fall into that category. When you give someone your word, then you must do your best to come through with whatever you promise. Now, when I asked the question originally, who do you trust? How many of you said God before you name any of those other people I mentioned? Raise your hand. Okay, I see you out there. But remember, Shakespeare says, to thy own self be true. But God is the first person that should come to our mind when we talk about trust. Because I, I said that sometimes people will let you down. Well, you don't have to worry about that with God because God will never let you down. And the other point is, he has everything that you need. The song, whatever you need, God's got it. It's very true. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. So if all that belong to God, then you know that God will provide you with whatever you need. But all you have to do is trust in him. We must realize too that God sometimes places people in our lives to help us out in our time of need. God works through other people. So when, when, when that happens, we must be careful to always give God the thanks and give God the praise for it because it is God working through someone else. Example, some of you have received your stimulus check over the last couple of weeks. And those who are, have not received it, received it, I know that you are still wait, waiting patiently and some waiting impatiently to receive it. But the point of that is that the stimulus check does not come from that man that lives in 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue 
It does not come from the Congress. It comes through them, but it comes from God. So when you get it, and if you haven't, if you haven't gotten, when you get it, please make sure that you realize where it comes from and make sure that you give thanks to God for it. If you already spent it, still give God thanks for it because you had the opportunity to do what you wanted to do with it. Now let's look at some real life situation that deals with trust. The first situation or incident I'm gonna to talk to you about is sometimes you've heard of, you've seen on TV, you might have been a part of it. Sometimes company has what they call team building exercises. And a part of that team building exercise sometimes is an activity where they have two people. One person will stand in front of the other person with their back to the person. And the idea is that this person will let go and fall back and the person behind them uh, will catch them before they fall to the floor. That's the trust because in order to let yourself go, you have to trust that that person is going to catch you and not let you fall and maybe injure yourself. Now, in the bigger picture, when we talk about trust and trusting God for what you need, in that exercise, I've said that you have to let yourself go. That's speaking to us. When we say we trust God, we have to let ourselves go. We have to put ourselves into his hand completely and trust that he will keep us from falling and not allow injury to come to us. But now there is a caveat. Sometimes God may allow us to fall for different reasons. Maybe it's because of our own doing, or maybe there's something that God is teaching us and he's using this as a lesson, or maybe it's just the test of our faith. So sometimes he do allow us to fall, but we must remember, we all fall down, but the difference between a sinner and a saint is that the saint gets back up again. So if you do happen to fall, God will reach way down and pick you up. If you have fallen by the wayside of life, dreams have been shattered, left on the ground, you don't have to stay in the shape that you're in. The potter will pick you, put you back together again. Words of a song reign very true when we're talking about trust. The second situation, there was a man, uh, had a family, and one day he decided, one morning he decided he was going to go in the kitchen and he was going to fix a meal for his family. Now, now I must interject here that this man in the situation is not me because I kind of know my way around the kitchen. But anyway, as he was fixing the meal, his wife came in and she kind of looked around the kitchen. And she asked him, after seeing the condition that the kitchen was in, she asked him, what are you making? And he said, a mess. Sometimes we make a mess of our lives. And sometimes we can't get it back together ourselves. That's a situation where we need God because God will bless us in the middle of our mess. And we try to straighten it up, we make a, a bigger mess, but God will straighten it out. But all you have to do is trust in him. That's the important thing. Third situation, when I was a boy, I heard my father and some of the other adults having a conversation. And they were talking about a man that lived in our community. And he was driving his truck in downtown Sumter. And you must remember now, this is back in the day when most cars and trucks didn't have air conditioning. So he had the window down in his truck. And the significance of that is that as he was turning onto a street, there were some people standing on the sidewalk. And someone yelled out to him as he was turning to go down the street, hey, you can't go down there. And so he yelled back, that's all right. I think I can make it. But the problem was he was turning onto a one-way street. What's the significance of that? Sometimes we go down the wrong way. We make wrong turns in life. And we go down 
places that we shouldn't have gone. And there may be someone on the sideline of our life that's telling us you shouldn't go down there. That is the wrong way to go. And we do just like the man in the truck. That's okay, I got this. I can make it. We think we can make it without trusting in God. In addition to that, sometimes there's a voice that's speaking to us, even if nobody else says anything. There's a voice that speaks to us and tells us that you're going the wrong way. You're doing things that's not pleasing in the eyes of the Lord. And just like the man in the truck, sometimes we disregard the expressions of others or the opinion of others or what they're trying to tell us. That is because of lack of trust. We must trust in God. Now, sometimes when we get things or we ask God for, for something, God will supply all our needs, as we mentioned earlier. But sometimes it's a contingency plan. It is contingent upon something else. We must realize that in order to receive what we desire from God, we must do what God asks us to do. Some example, if we go to the Word, some example. We all are familiar, especially here at Grand Hill, we are familiar with the scripture. Second Chronicles 7, 14. The last part of that scripture says, I will hear from heaven and I will heal your land. That's trusting in God. But then if we go back to the first part of the scripture, there are some contingencies there. There are some caveats. Because he said, if my people will call by my name. There are some things that you have to do. And he said you should humble yourself and pray. You should seek his face and turn from your wicked ways. So those things, the promise on that one is conditional. It's based upon what we do. Another good example is Psalms 37 and 4. The last part of that says, I will give you the desires of your heart. That's the promise. But then the first part is the caveat because it said, if you delight yourself in me, and of course, sometimes we kind of overlook that part, but that, the, the, the promise is based on what you do. If you don't do your part, then God is not going to bless you. You're not going to receive what he has from you unless you do your part. Now, that's the scripture from the day. Let's go to our scripture for the day. Is 2 King 5, 1 through 14. And these verses tell the story of a man named Naaman. Naaman was a captain of the guards in the Syrian army. And it says he was a mighty man of battle. He had fought and won many wars. Naaman went on an expedition into Israel. And as often is the case, when they went into Israel, they brought back some of the people to be servant to the people of Syria. He brought back a little girl from Israel who served as the handmaiden to Naaman's wife. And Naaman developed leprosy. And we know how leprosy was in Bible and Biblical time, what a dread, dreadful disease it was, and how people avoided people who were afflicted with it. Naaman developed leprosy. But this girl, that was brought back from Israel, told Naaman's wife about that there is a man, there is a prophet in Samaria who can heal leprosy. And so Naaman, after his wife told him, went to the king, and he told the king what the girl had said. And the king gave Naaman a letter to go to Samaria and find the prophet, to go to the king of Israel and, and ask him, to help him recover from leprosy. So Naaman went and took the letter to the king. But when the king got the letter, he said, who does the king of Syria think I am, God, that I can heal leprosy? He became very upset. The Bible says he ran his clothes, he tore his clothes, he became very upset, upset because he thought it was some kind of trick to engage him in a war. But Naaman heard about the king being upset. And so he went 
he sent a messenger to the king to tell the king to send him to me. And by the help of God, by the power of God, I will help him recover from his leprosy. And so Naaman went to the house where the prophet Elijah was. And when he got there, Elijah sent out a messenger to tell him, if you want to be healed from leprosy, go wash seven times in Jordan. Now Naaman had a problem with that because he, was, he said that the Jordan River was one of the dirtiest rivers around and I know some cleaner rivers that I can wash in. Why did he tell me to go wash in Jordan? And he was upset. But luckily for him, his servants talked to him and said, Damon, Captain, if God had told you to do a great thing, then you would have been willing to do it. But because he told you to do this little thing, then you don't want to do it. And so they were able to convince him and of course he went on and he did what the prophet told him and he dipped himself in Jordan, in the Jordan River seven times and he came up, said his skin was pure as a little child. He was cured of his leprosy. And then Naaman went and seek out the prophet again to thank him for what he had done and offer him a gift. What did we learn? What is our takeaway from the story of Naaman? First of all, the servant girl told her mistress about the prophet Elijah. That means that she was spreading the word. Her belief in God and belief in the man of God is what caused Naaman to be able to be cured. Second point, Elijah asked the king to send Naaman to him. He knew who to turn to for help. He knew that he, he was the one that was able. And he didn't just sit there, but he, he helped where he could, where the king was upset. And he knew what he could do. So he let the king know that he could perform this task. Next point. Naaman was upset, upset with Elijah for two things. Number one, when he went to his house, Elijah didn't come out to greet him. He sent his, his servant out. Some of us, Sometimes we get to be so important, we get to be so big until we want to be recognized, we want people to bow down to us, we want people to be humble in our presence. But when we get that big and we think that much of ourselves, it is time to take a gut check and realize that we are not that important. Even though Naaman was a powerful man, he wasn't that important. And that's the point that, that Elijah was making why he didn't come out to him. He wanted to let him know that, that he wasn't that powerful. The second thing that he was upset with Elijah about is that he told him to go wash in the Jordan River and there were other rivers that he would prefer. In other words, he had leprosy, which was a terrible disease, but yet he didn't want to do what the prophet told him to do. He didn't want to do it God's way. He wanted to do it the way he wanted to do. Sound familiar? Naaman is not the only one. And God tells us what we need to do in order to receive what we need. Do we trust him or do we say, wouldn't this be better if we do it this way? He didn't trust the words of the prophet. Next point, his servants were able to convince him that what the prophet told him, if he had told him to do something big, he would have done it. People in our lives, as I mentioned earlier, who are placed there to carry out the instructions and the work of God. Because Naaman, even though he was in the state of being upset with Elijah, he did listen to what the people around him were saying. And we have to do the same thing. Next point. When Naaman decided to do it God's way, he was healed. His servant had to convince him to trust God. And we shouldn't have to be convinced to trust God. That should come automatically. When you don't trust God, there will be consequences. 
And we have several examples of this in the Bible. You remember John, when he didn't want to go where God sent him, and he ended up in the belly of a fish because he did not obey what God told him to do. The children of Israel, after God led them out of Egypt, when they were out there in the wilderness, decided to build them a golden calf that they would worship because they didn't trust God. Later on, when they were on the brink of going into the promised land, and God had told them, I've already given you the land, but they did not go because they were afraid of the people who was in the land, and they didn't listen to the report that was brought back. They listened to the other 10, but they didn't listen to the two who brought the good report because they didn't trust God. Peter, our good friend Peter, when he was in the boat and Jesus appeared on the water and he said, Master, if it be you, bid me to come. And Peter started walking on the water as long as he kept his eye on Jesus. But then when the wind became boisterous, Peter took his eyes off of Jesus and that's when he began to sing. Message today, when you take your eyes off the master, you can do nothing but sink. Long as he was trusting Jesus, he was all right. But if he took his eyes off him, that's when the trouble began. So we have to remember, keep your eyes on the prize. Continue to trust in Jesus. A key verse, we're going to close with our key verse for today. Therefore, it's coming from Mark 11 24. Therefore, I say unto you, whosoever you ask for in prayer, believe that you will receive it, and it shall be yours. Believe in God, trust in God. Continue to encourage each other, continue to pray for each other, be safe. Be blessed, and we'll talk to you again soon.
that God is still, even now, willing and able to work on our behalf. So we may be a little scarred from our journey, but thank God we're still 